Hello, I'm Michelle. And I'm Lucy. Welcome to the 20th episode of Tudoriferous, the biographical podcast that examines the lives in Tudor era. And today, the lovely Polydor Virgil. Polydor Virgil, the man we keep Ooh. calling Snide. <laughs> now, you were quite put, a, put out by yes. getting this one. <laughs> Yes, yes, I, I was. I think you described it as a downer. <laughs> it was a very big downer. I just thought, great, we've been calling him Snide this whole time. I got to do, oh, Dudley and Emson, and now I've got to do Virgil. But Well, hopefully he's nice, nicer than you thought. We shall see. But anyway, first, first. Oh, gosh. Yes, given that you couldn't even remember that we'd recorded John to the poll, I hope you're going to get the answers. Oops. <laughs> yes. Have we done him? <laughs> oh, man. Well, it's just, I kept thinking we had, but then I'm like, am I remembering his father? No. We did do yeah. him, right? Yeah. Uh -oh. No, we did do him. Yeah. No, I must admit he's disappeared. I'm, I've, I'm all en engrossed in Philip the Fair now, so John de la Pole is a distant memory for yes, me yes, too. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but anyway, the quiz. Oh, the quiz. Okay, let's go. Question one. Who was his mother? Mrs. de la Pole. <laughs> no, um... Yeah, you know this. Warwick. No, I don't remember. <laughs> Keep thinking well, who, was he was, his, who, was his, who was his dad married to? Well, it wasn't Margaret Beaufort. No. <laughs> uh, Anne. No, don't remember. Elizabeth Plantagenet. Oh, yes. Right. Yes, the sister. the sister. Everybody's sister. Everybody's for forgotten sister. <laughs> <laughs> She's forgotten, yes. But again, that's not about him. His mother. <laughs> who was his mother? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, who was John de la Pole's mother? Right, number two. On the 19th of July, 1483, Lincoln went on progress with Richard III. Yes. It was cut short due to a rebellion. Yes. Who was leading this rebellion? Again, that's not him. <laughs> <laughs> and I have no idea. <laughs> it's one of the very early ones. It's, it's, you should do. It's um, the one that Margaret had a little yeah, mix in. Yeah, I'm trying. It's not Beaufort. It's um, the Duke of Buckingham. The Duke of Buckingham, yeah. yep, that's right. He was a Beaufort. On 17th of Feb <laughs> 17th February 1487, Lincoln was present at the confession of... This is, again, this is not about him. <laughs> but he was president at the confession of William Simmons. What did Simmons confess to? Oh, uh, well, he said he abducted the son of uh, an organ mender and yeah. took him to Ireland to be the Earl of Warwick. Was it there? He did. Person? With um, little... Edward. Lambert Simnel. Yes. Yeah. That's right. At the Battle of Stoke, what weapon did the mercenaries fighting for Lincoln, that's about him, have that Henry didn't have? What weapon? Hmm. We speculated that if they were to live up to their names, you would have to have very big ones. <laughs> Has that just made it more confusing? I have no idea. <laughs> handguns. Oh, right. It was the first yeah, time we were, mentioned handguns. Yeah, like yeah. a bluster bust or something. Yes. Yeah. Right, five. Who was, this again, it's not entirely about him. Who was buried at Fifield in Oxfordshire, one of Lincoln's attainted properties? Oh. We, we came across her to her. <laughs> I've just given that away. You felt very sorry for her. I feel sorry for a lot of people in this. Yeah, I felt sorry for her too. His, I don't know. Catherine Gordon. Oh, poor Catherine. Mrs. Perkin yeah. Warbeck. Yes. Right, well it was a long time ago we recorded that. Also, and you was... broke the rules again. <laughs> I did break the rules again. Yeah, when I'm writing them, it seems, because I keep writing Lincoln and Don, Jean de la Pole, it seems that they're about him. <laughs> <laughs> when he was doing this, what was somebody else doing? <laughs> oh man, I'm like, she's totally going to ask where he took over for Richard. And that was York. <laughs> I know that one. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> ah, okay. Whoops. Sorry. <laughs> I'll do better. Sorry. Do better next time. 
I seem to get the people that seem to have things done to them. Well, no, actually, he did go off and do stuff. I can't complain. Yeah, he did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, on to oh. Polydor Virgil. <laughs> mm, looking forward to this one because all the other ones, I feel I've got snippets of their lives, but Polydor Virgil, they're nothing. Yeah. Apart from the bits of his histories that have popped up, but not about him. There's a bit of a reason for that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was it. That was. It. Um, I hope you enjoyed the episode. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. No, we do have a bit. <laughs> Come with me, if you will. It is a warm spring evening. The day was crisp in the morning, and then as it warmed up, you had managed to enjoy a quick break from the kitchens to listen to the birds outside while you had a bite of food. You're serving food at a great banquet this evening. It's your first time, and you are the youngest server at only 15. You've been practicing your graceful bow to present the dishes for weeks with the head server. Yesterday, he'd finally, grudgingly, said you don't look too much like a clumsy ox. You have cleaned up and been inspected to ensure your clothing is in order, and the towel over your shoulder is neatly folded. The server beside you got his ears boxed for not cleaning his nails well enough and sent off to correct that unforgivable lapse. You peek into the great hall at the dignitaries. All of the servers are hoping to be able to listen tonight. A number of scholars have gathered for debate, and you have all heard of the dispute between Erasmus and this newcomer, Polydor Virgil. You look curiously at the man. He's lean, dressed as a clergyman, clean-shaven. You have heard that he may be writing the history of England for Henry the Seventh. You get a nasty smack from behind. The head server tells you to stop gopping and get into the kitchen. You need to line up to begin taking the food into the great hall. You quickly scamper into the kitchen and are given your dish. You line up with the others. <sighs> you breathe deeply. You just keep repeating to yourself, don't drop the food. You step forward and dip, holding the platter forward and up for inspection at the head table. You can do this. If successful, you will be a server with a better income and better lodgings. You have an eye on another girl, but she does not respect people who aren't actively in the dining hall. The line begins to move, and with anxiety and excitement, you step forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Polydor Virgil, the man we have been calling snide because of all the quotes we found from him may possibly have been a footnote in this podcast if it wasn't for his interactions with the Tudor court, especially in his writing of the English history for the Tudor monarchy specifically. He was, well, he's a lot more like Geoffrey Chaucer than I'd like, in that we still have his writings, but do not know a lot about the man himself. Okay. Yeah. That's um that's a bit of a drawback for a, for a biographical podcast. <laughs> it is. We do have a little bit to talk about though. I believe he is the first person we're going to discuss that only had a few years in the reign of Henry the 7th and then remained in England after the transition to the reign of Henry the 8th. So the majority of his lifetime is in Henry the 8th's court. But because we have so many to cover with Henry the 8th, he's one of the people that we put in the lesser amount of people to discuss in the pool. Also, it's good to look at the the, the back end of Henry the Seventh's reign, because we've got quite quite a few, aren't they? At the beginning. Beginning. Yes. And before the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we need to cover it all. Yes. Especially since the, the last bit of his reign is quite different from the first bit, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. <laughs> Virgil was born most likely in Urbino, Italy, possibly okay. in 1470. <laughs> Polydor Virgil, or Polydoro Virgilio, was not a man that came from nothing, unlike some of the others that we have spoken about. If the sources are accurate, his great-grandfather, Antony Virgil, was a doctor of physic, which is medicine, and philosophy at the University of Paris. So this family moved around quite a bit. Though we aren't sure of his father's profession, we do know that he was favored by dukes, so Polydor had an inn at the higher levels. We know he studied at Padua University from a letter he wrote to James IV of Scotland. He was ordained as a priest in 1496, though I could not find where he was educated as a priest. 
This episode, unfortunately, is going to be a lot of we think and maybes, but also some we knows. Mm. There appear to have been biographies of him, but they've been lost to time. Much of the we knows are written from books that were written by historias, historians <laughs> from decades, sometimes centuries earlier, that mention biographies that they researched. But I can't find any current publications of these books now, nor can I even find mentions of them in Google, unless you're looking at these specific journal articles. He was successful in his early career, becoming the secretary to the Duke of Urbino. And while working for the Duke, he wrote the proverbium. Okay, this is going to be hard for me. All of these have different names, and most of them are Latin. Well, all of them are in Latin. Proverborium Libellus, published in 1498, which is a collection of Latin proverbs and was the first book of its kind. Nobody had ever done a collection of proverbs. Mm -hmm. Polydor also wrote mm. the De Rerum Inventoribus, published in 1499. This is a treatise on inventions. Rabbit Hole had to look up what a treatise is. <laughs> Do you know what <laughs> it is? I didn't know. I don't know. I assumed it was like a sort of dissertation or something. When I looked it up, the best description I found was that it's a systematic writing on a subject that portrays the work through a timeline, showing it started here, it developed here, it changed here, et cetera, et cetera. Like a step-by-step -step guide of how somebody figured it out. Hmm. I didn't know it was that specific. Yes, it will also include specific facts about it, the principles behind the invention, and the methods of the subject in question. So how that person figured out what they were doing, including their errors. It's like how we know, oh, oh I'm going to totally screw this up. Was it Thomas Edison that hmm. kept making the light bulb and found 10,000 ways not to make a light bulb? I think so, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Well, is, is that book still extant? yes. Oh, because that would be fascinating. A it? lot of the ones that I'm talking about are in existence. I will warn you, when you're getting them, you will, there will be multiple copies and all of them will say something different in English. Mm. <laughs> so I, I, it's up to the translator and I found three copies of this specific one all had, were wildly different in the way they were translated. So I couldn't tell you which one's accurate. And that's that's odd, isn't it? Because that, that's pretty much a scientific document, I suppose, isn't it? Or pre-scientific scientific document. And that's wildly different. You, know, you can imagine what literature and poetry is going to be like. Yes. Right. Yes. Much like authors of academic journals now, Polydor managed to become embroiled in some arguments within the intelligentsia. <laughs> One of the they love it. They yes, love they good, really good do row. like it. <laughs> <laughs> they do. One of the academics that Polydor butted heads with and very early was another scholar on our list of subjects, Erasmus. Mm, yeah, he liked a, a bit of a bit I of an argument, didn't he? Yeah, it's almost like if if they were a rugby player, they'd be getting in like fistfights. <laughs> it's one of those kind of academics. Are they? Oh, because, cause, yeah, because I've been reading about Bernard Andre. He's in his element when it, you have a nice poem off, sort of, <laughs> so, so that you all shout poetry at each other. And you can imagine if any you of know, them saying, hold me back, hold me back. But if they were, you know, if, if nobody did hold them back, they just, they wouldn't do anything. <laughs> no, they wouldn't. <laughs> they pretend there's a fence there. Yes. <laughs> These arguments are exactly what you would see today. Who is the better scholar? Who thought of something first? Who stole whose idea? Mm -hmm. In particular for Erasmus and Polydor is the, the fact that Polydor published his, de, no, not the Dererim, sorry, Prover, <sighs> Proverborium Libellus. He said, I did it first. And Erasmus claimed he had published his before Polydor. Though in reality, Polydor's was published two years earlier than Erasmus, and you could find that just by the published dates. They did work it out eventually, because they are there are records of them being friends and colleagues later. But I was, was going to say, did Erasmus just say, oh, well, fair enough, the best man won? It sounds as if they actually might have done. 
He he did, but it's like 12 years later, he's still saying that, no, really, mine was published first. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know if they totally settled it or they just got to the point where, you know what? I like you. I'm just going to ignore the fact that you, you tread on my toes. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> A quick note here. When titling the various works of Polydor, one of the reasons why I'm struggling with the pronunciation is I found that the titles are all presented in multiple ways. And I'll give you an example. His most famous writing, known as the Anglia Historia, is also known as the Anglica Historia, the Historia hmm. Anglia, and the Historica Anglica. <laughs> so you can and just there, add an extra ca in where you like. It seems. Yes, it seems <laughs> like it. If you're going to go searching for these, try a bunch of different spellings because you will get different results every time you put in a different spelling, too. <laughs> for us, at least for me, the easiest writings of Virgil's to obtain were the Angli Historia excerpts, which include his history of Henry VI, Edward IV, and Richard III. Although I don't think this was his most famous work during his lifetime. That would have been the De Inventorius Re Rerum. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> the invention book. Oh, yes. That was written in 1499, and it has been published at least 30 editions hmm. between his lifetime and when we get into what we consider modern history. And again, like so many things, historians don't all agree on exactly how many. So I just went with more than 30. Mm. Some people say 50, but I couldn't find anything backing that up. In his writing of the De Inventoribus Rerum, he writes with a more rational approach than expected from a priest. I thought it totally would have been religious, but it is not. And... When I say it is not, and I was surprised, he managed to offend the church by his writing, even though he was a member of the clergy. I think it was easy to do, though, wasn't it? It was, but... You had to walk a very fine line, I think, at that time. Yeah, and he decided to hop over it like a long mm. jump. <laughs> Surprisingly... So what, in, what way was, in what way does he offend the church? Why are you coming to that? Uh, well, he questions whether or not God is Ooh. there. Oh. Yeah. That's a big one. Because these, in, because the inventions are based on logic and physics, then rules that exist, this is me interpreting what I think the offense was. The rules that exist mean that God didn't just create things, that something else has created order. It, it's a completely different thought process. Originally, at this time, God just decided things were going to be there. And if there are actual rules that people can follow to increase their understanding, specifically physics, then there isn't an overall being saying it is this way. And that's right. kind of the way I got it. And it, it did definitely offend the church. Well, I think it yeah, yeah, probably would, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's not the line they take. No. No. What yeah. did surprise me is it didn't result in a mass banning and burning of his work, like I found mentions for other authors at the time. Instead, the church demanded that certain offending passages were removed and other items altered, and then the text was just reprinted again. Only the unaltered texts were banned and required to be burnt. So how do we know, we, so we know about this? Some of them the survived. Pre previous, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. I thought it was just, just <laughs> through interaction with the, with the church. No, uh, like I said with the Geoffrey Chaucer, mm. we have a lot of his work. We just don't know a ton about the man himself. Hmm. And you, if you start reading all of his works through the republishing, you can see a bit of his personality because the tone changes as you get through his life. Right. He seems quite optimistic. Does he get more snidey or less snidey? More. He doesn't come across as snide at all in his, his beginning work. <laughs> it's more of a, 
I got the idea of like a young boy who's just discovered something so cool and he really needs to tell absolutely everybody about it with a great big smile on his face. That's mm-hmm. what it feels like on his first publications. And then as he goes on in Lifetime, he gets grumpier and grumpier and grumpier, just like a regular boy. <laughs> I was say that. that sounds familiar. As soon as you have to do the work, it's no longer fun. <laughs> I shouldn't say that for a boy. It's the same with everybody. I don't want to do this. This is a job now. (laughs) (laughs) Later in his career, Polydor became the Chamberlain to Pope Alexander VI, Rodrigo Mm. Borgia. He was then promoted as an agent for the Pope. He was sent over to England by the Pope. This is how he came into the Tudor court. He was sent as a sub-collector for Cardinal Adriano Castelli. Oh, or yes, Cas- we'll come across him. Yes, or <laughs> Castellesi, or Castello, or Castellensis, <laughs> to collect the Denari Sancti Petri, or Peter's Pence. It's also mm. known as the Alms of St. Peter. The and money owed to the, owed to the papal court. Yeah, the money owed to the Pope. Rabbit hole alert. <laughs> 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 These are payments made directly to the Holy See of the Catholic Church. And... I, I'd never heard of it, so I went looking. The Vatican history says that this payment orig- originated with the Anglo-Saxons, which I thought was really cool. In England, they started this collection as a direct payment of annual contribution to the Pope himself. And from there, the collection spread out to the rest of Europe. The payment was supposed to support the pontificate directly, while the rest of the contributions made in England for everything else, would support the local churches, monasteries, convents, provide social support for the homeless, poor, and anyone ill that came to the churches for medical aid. So this contribution is specifically to go to the Pope. Hmm. People just paying out all the time, weren't they? They I wonder if there's a resentment of the church because of constantly paying out to these things, tithes and... And they were landlords. So you're paying them, mm. and then again, and then now I'm finding out a third time if you mm. want to support the Pope directly, and you were expected to by this time. Were you made to or just expected to? Oh, or is it hard to tell? That's bit, really hard to tell. Is it a bit like when you go into cathedrals now and there's a voluntary donation that yeah. you are ch- you're channeled through, yep. so you're forced to make this voluntary donation as you go in? It's also very difficult to tell how much because some people were paying in chickens or in piglets if you were wealthier. So food was quite often presented. Or around this area, in this area, you pay with eels. Ew. Mm. <laughs> I don't <laughs> like eels. Sorry. Apparently, de- apparently delicious. I don't know. Obviously, I've never had them. But I've come across people paying their rent to, to local monastery um, glastonbury abbey for instance yeah and you pay you pay eels and they've got great big well they had great big ponds where they could store all these eels <laughs> oh my goodness i think everyone playing in eels that's a lot of eels yeah mm. but they do travel really well um i'm trying yeah they to... get sent to japan now yes the eels well, out of as this, long as this they're in the back. even a moist cloth they can still breathe so they survive mm. for quite a long time out of water I, I, if you really, yeah, don't, don't, don't <laughs> Google preparation of eel. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 I'm not going to. Oh, God. No. <laughs> the Peter's Pence contribution is still practiced today, surprisingly. Yeah, I have heard of it. Yes, I don't. Yeah. So if you're, if you're a Roman Catholic, you, you still have, you still pay up, presumably. Yep. And you can make the direct contribution to the Vatican online using a credit card. Handy. <laughs> The Vatican's website quotes Pope Benedict the Sixteenth as saying, Peter's Pence is the most characteristic expression of the participation of all the faithful in the Bishop of Rome's charitable initiatives in favor of the universal church. Hmm. That was a very long sentence. I bet you don't pay in pence anymore. That's probably pounds at least. <laughs> you can choose how much you pay. Hmm. But I'm assuming it's, it's not going to be pence. Mil- no, <laughs> no. Back to Polydor. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> there is some suggestion that the reason he was chosen for this post was due to the fact that Cardinal Castelli was an uncle or a distant cousin. There is a bit of 
back and forth whether or not he was related because Castelli is sometimes given at the end of Polydor Virgil's name in some of the publications. Sorry, there's a couple of a couple of riders have just gone past, and both of them are watching. Have got their phones out. Oh, jeez! <laughs> oh my goodness! <laughs> Sorry, yeah, that's okay. Castellazzi. <laughs> yes. So be, his name was appended to the end of Polydor Virgil's. From what I can find, the reason this becomes a question is because if you were traveling with somebody like that, your passport were would sometimes have their name on it as well to show that you were a group. And believe it or not, there were passports. So you had, it's basically a letter from your ruler saying, yes, I give you permission to leave the country. Yes, because John de la Pole, Edmund de la Pole, various others, they got into trouble for leaving without Without permission, didn't they? Yes. Yeah. So... I don't think that they were related, but some some historians have claimed that they are distant cousins. I was going to say, the originating documents for that aren't available. You can't find them, or at least I can't. They're not available online. But scholars have appeared to enjoy arguing about this for several decades now. Right. <laughs> I love reading journal articles where it says, this person obviously got it wrong. <laughs> I'm like, Back wow. in 1963, I said this. <laughs> not even in 1963, because we're going back to 1930-something. They obviously did not have the same abilities. And I'm like, whoa, like, you're really nasty. Let's draw out the swords on guard. Well, there's nothing like an academic to bear a crutch, is there? <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> even though he was an agent to the Pope, Virgil was actually under suspicion of sympathizing with Luther at the time. <laughs> Not to say anything to be suspected of, though it appears he came to no harm regardless of those suspicions. He seems but, to be sort of Teflon man, doesn't he? Because he's he yeah. has constant brushes with the church, but or a very doesn't stick. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he must maybe he had charm. Maybe. Yeah. He did not set foot in England until 1502, only seven years before the death of Henry VII. But when he did arrive, he was treated very well by Henry. Polydor Henry arrived... Was, Henry was very keen on having um, high, uh, high-ranking high or intelligent foreigners in his court, wasn't it? It made it more sophisticated, made it yes. made us look less of a backwater. Yes. So, yeah, I should imagine he probably did welcome him. Yes. Also, the Renaissance was now in full swing in England, and everyone it, it came across as an obsession about anything Italian, which included its scholars. So Polydor was immediately welcomed. There was no, you need to take time to impress me. It was just like, come in! Yes. <laughs> Henry VII, knowing of Polydor's writings, because he did bring some with him, asked him to write the history of England in 1505. He must have impressed Henry because he was preferred, preferred, which means given, Mm -hmm. the Archdeaconry of Wells in 1508. This means he was given a living through that Archdeaconry. So he was now an Archdeacon. He was also rewarded with canonries in Lincoln, Hereford, and St. Paul's, where he would live and write later. I was going to say, if you... If you're expected actually to work in these places, you can't get much further away than Wells and Lincoln. Yeah, that's Wells, what I is, was Wells wondering. is just up the road from here. Lincoln is way over to the east. <laughs> so, and he, he was given he, those positions concurrently, so at the exact same mm. time. So I don't know how he would have done the work for both. I don't think you're expected to go to these places, are you? They're just nominal, and that's you just get your money. Sinecures, that's the yeah. word. Yeah. Sinecures, yeah. I mean, These you'd be look- just riding backwards and forwards the whole time with it. I can't see it happening. We do know that he did visit each. So maybe he did it on a circuit, had mm-hmm. people underneath him, and then he would go around kind of like a judge, figuring maybe. out and settling things. These are the locations where he began his History of England in Latin. The history consists of 26 or 27 books. It is a very large writing piece, so I'm not surprised it took him years. It began during the reign of Henry VII, but finished it late in Henry VIII's reign. Now, does it cover, does, is it, does he write right up to the point 
of his death? Or when does it finish? It finishes when he, like, before he dies. Yeah. Yeah, but it starts, I'm trying to remember. Is it 780? I don't know. I think right after Bede? It's, if you have thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, you can get copies of it printed. I bought one of the cheaper ones, which was the excerpts. It's those three reigns, and it was quite expensive because they're not regular print. When you pay for it, you're actually paying for them to print a single item of it. Hmm. So it is quite expensive, but you can get the entire thing. Uh, if anybody's interested and you're in British Columbia, Simon Fraser University has a copy that you are able to read. You have to wear gloves. You have to do an appointment. Mm -hmm. But yes, they do have a copy. Mm. Through the links. Do we, do we know how many copies are left? Uh, there are four in Canada that I'm aware of. Oh, right. It, well, presumably quite a lot then. I'm... It was printed so many times mm. that I'm not surprised that it still exists for how often also there's another reason it it's still around and i'll explain that in a little while okay through his links with henry the seventh and his writing of the history polydor was naturalized as an english citizen in 1510 by henry the eighth normally you have to pay a lot of fees for this to happen and this means that you have free travel you don't have to constantly get a letter of introduction everywhere you go in england mm -hmm. it, it is quite a big deal but polydor didn't have to pay the fees i found no evidence of bribes either which is the normal route of encouraging people to get you naturalized but so did they feel that he'd sort of paid his way by writing the history or was paying his way by writing the history? I'm not sure. We do mm. know that he also kept some seriously historically famous company. Bishop Fox, Thomas More, Desiderius Erasmus, William Warham, William Grosin, John Collett, Thomas Lin Lineker, uh, Bishop Cuthbert Tunstall, all people of great influence with either or and... Both Henry the Seventh and Henry the Eighth. Hmm. Well, it may have been I know all the right people. It yeah. also could have been his personality or his intelligence or him writing the history. We just we don't know. Hmm. It's no harm to know people, is it? No. <laughs> Isn't that the better way to do things? You don't have to know things. You need to know people. Yes. He left England in 1512, so we have made a jump. We are now in the reign of Henry VIII. We do not know why, but it appears that uh, Wolsey, we know that name, <laughs> yeah, had the expectation that Polydor was to advocate on his behalf to become a cardinal while he was in Italy. Henry VIII requested Polydor's return in 1515. Uh, requested or demanded? It was a request, but when he returned, spies and intrigue were still the mainstay of politics for Henry and Wolsey. Wolsey was not a bishop, but he had already become essential to Henry. Hmm. Polydor appears to have made an incredibly critical error while he was in Rome. He had sent out letters, both in Italy and back to England, that were intercepted. When Virgil's letters were read, they were found to be mm, critical of Wolsey. And by critical, I mean he was accused of vilifying Wolsey for corruption, basically saying he should be kicked out. Well, I think that was quite a common thing against Wolsey, wasn't he? He was a very rich man. Yes. And, uh... But, uh, yeah, Virgil yeah, but... did it in writing to multiple people. Mm. When he arrived back in England, he was thrown in the tower. Oh, right. Oh. I am not sure if this was true because I found no actual evidence of it, but there was an additional charge of forging dispensations that was put against Polydor. That seems to have been more com quite common, really, doesn't it? Because I know yes. Caxton, Caxton printed out quite a few. Yes. Like, we'll just... Keep on doing this. You don't need the Pope. Yeah. 
Wolsey, of course, would have been angry. He had entrusted business to Polydor and expected that Polydor was going to put his name forward for cardinalship. Polydor had done exactly the opposite. But he was released in September of the same year, so he was there for about five to six months. We aren't sure entirely. Whatever he had written in that letter, though, also resulted in Henry VIII persuading Pope Leo X, we're now on to a different pope, to remove Polydor from the office of Collector of Peter's Pence. And Cardinal Adriano Castelli was also deprived of the collectorship and his English cardinalship. He was very... Very, um, quite an Anglophile, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Yeah. And that, co- that's the bloke, if, uh, just to remind people, that's the one who was throwing the dinner party when Alexander Rodrigo. and Cesare became ill, stroke dead. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It is a uh, suspect when you find out that his cardinalship was then given to Wolsey hmm. by Henry VIII. It's so open for con- corruption isn't it when you can just it take is. things from people and hand them over to somebody else it's just yes ugh. this is the first time that i know of that a king has given somebody a cardinal ship usually the cardinals oh, yeah. are chosen by the pope no they were yeah i did i didn't even spot that bit of corruption <laughs> Never mind yeah it. <laughs> well it says that henry gave it to him but it doesn't it doesn't explicitly exclude permission from the pope so maybe he got permission to do it but hmm. nothing that I found in the history actually says he applied to Pope Leo, Pope Leo approved it. It just says Henry took the cardinalship and gave it to Wolsey. Yeah, because he is Cardinal Wolsey. That's his name, yes. isn't it? Cardinal Wolsey. Yes, this yes. is his name. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, hmm. Yeah, and I'd love to know if anybody has that information or you could put a bug in Bree and Fry's ear and ask them to mm-hmm. see if they could find out. But it seems like Henry VIII gave it to him. The tower for Polydor couldn't have been pleasant. He would never again mix in politics or religion, religious debates within England. He just zipped his lips. By his own choice or because he wasn't invited to to talk to anywhere? It appears to be his own choice. Mm. He probably thought he's been in trouble so many times through things he's said and written. He should shut up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but this would finally got him in prison. <laughs> I would have thought that I would made him leave England entirely. Like, fine, I'm done with you. I'm not staying. But he remained until 1553. That's 40 years later. I still liked it. Yeah. In 1555, he did return to Italy. He somehow managed to redeem himself to Henry somewhat, though it seems to have taken quite a long time. By 1522, he was restored to the clerical positions he had been originally given. Is what? that, I'm trying to, I've lost the timeline that far ahead, but is that, af, is that after Wolsey has fallen? Oh, I don't know. I didn't look at that. Ah, because that might be. Why? Yeah, one goes up, the other goes down. Hmm. hmm. Anyway, we'll be doing Wolsey in several years' time, so yes. we'll find out. Sorry, I missed that. I'll try to keep my brain a little more open. I'm, <laughs> I get really tunnel vision, I think, is the best way to put it. <laughs> I get focused on one person and stop looking for the links. I think I'm um, obsessed with links I, I, because I keep coming across them, especially with Philip the Fair. You think, wow, that's, that's a, this, he did this because they did that and they did that. And they, and you think, wow, I've, I've, sort of got, I've meshed everybody in this, this little web. And I get it's stuck really on exciting. facts and rabbit holes. <laughs> Just disappear down a hole for a while. And Jason's like, what are you looking at? That's my husband's name. <laughs> I'm like, uh, nothing. <laughs> so 15, 15, 1522, that's going to be seven years after he was thrown in the tower, He was restored to those clerical positions he had originally been given, but what got me thinking was that I couldn't find out if he had been completely pulled off those positions in those intermediate years. If he had, wouldn't they have been given to somebody else? And then how did he get them back? Would those people have then been kicked off his livings? The other thing is... is if they were Woolsey supporters, maybe. I don't know. I don't know, yeah. but... Yeah. Oh, yeah, that would make sense if we're going for the Woolsey theory. 
Wolsey's supporters go in, and then when Wolsey gets kicked out, his supporters get kicked out, and it goes back to him. I don't mm. know. I don't there's know. not an there's not enough records for this. If he had been removed from those, would he have been destitute and now poor, and that's why he couldn't leave? Don't know. Mm. Would he? And there's another thing. How much income do these people get from their writing? Because you hear about them all having patrons. But did he get paid once it was published? I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you're not, presumably you're not being paid while you're doing it. Like most writers. Yeah, well, they get paid for doing it by patrons. Yeah, that's true. If you've been asked to do it, that's a bit different, isn't it? Yes. A bit like getting asked by a publisher to been given an advance. The Duke of Urbino was the one who was paying him as a patron for the first two books that I mentioned. And they're they're dedicated to him. Because mm. he was the patron. But once they're published, I have no idea if they get paid for every time they get sold. Sometimes the patron changes, doesn't it, on different printings. Yes. So if the first one dies or falls out of favour or you fall out with them, suddenly a different patron pops up at the beginning of on the dedication. Yes, Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's an interesting thing. There's there's no accounting detail that survives that tells us how these writers actually made their livings. So I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. We can say that Polydor may be considered one of the most well-known and published Tudor scholar historians. Author Eugene Porter calls him England's first modern historian. This was not because of his birth in England, but because we found patrons that funded his work and life and his method of studying. So the Anglia Historia was one of particular interest to Henry VII as he commissioned it to be written. But uh, I doubt it met his approval. I've come across several quotes in it for the bottom of it that you know, other historians have quoted. Do you think, really? He got that past Henry? Yes. That seems very strange, because sometimes well, they seem to go com- completely opposite, but maybe if he is quite outspoken and... Says his mind just, anyway. Yeah, just says it. The first publications are pro Tudor, Right. But even though they are, Henry VII had, uh, I want to say, attempted to link his family with King Arthur. Yeah going so far as to name his son Arthur and claiming him to be the new Arthur. Polydor, in his critical look at the history, uh, even in the first publications, denied the existence of King Arthur. He said... He, he seems was, very different, because I'm going to be doing a special episode on Bernard Andre. Yes. Who is happy to say whatever the king wants him to say. <laughs> <laughs> so I think they're going to be quite good if we put them back to back these episodes and you can... See how two people approach history very differently. It <laughs> he, did. he made me laugh, Bernard Andre. <laughs> he did. Polydor made me go, ooh, like how did ooh. you not get in so much trouble? Have you got examples? Of- we do. Right. Specifically for this, for the King Arthur, obviously not a way to stay in Henry's good graces. Mm-hmm. But... Where it becomes a question is we don't know if that portion was written during Henry VII's lifetime. Finding copies that were written during Henry VII's lifetime, not possible for me. So I can't do a comparison there. What I can do a comparison of is the writings that were published during the rule of Henry VIII, who was not associated with King Arthur as much as his elder brother was, so he may have been able to get away with it then. Hmm. Well, I suppose the dynasty was already set by then, so they weren't frantically grappling for yes. for historical precedence, were they? Yes, but at this point, Henry still didn't have a son. Hmm. But Polydor is famous for being one of the first people to actually weigh previous histories and chronicles against the probability of fact. Oh, Bernard Andre doesn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> he also consults experts and actually went looking for people who had stories in those local areas to confirm or deny what had happened. 
and write the history as a narrative rather than a chronicle. This is why we say, or why Eugene Porter said he was the first modern historian. He took an actual critical look and tried to get a rounded view and provide it as a continuous timeline rather than blurps and bits in mm. it. Um, his anti-Athorian, Arthurian writings also sparked yet another round of debate and anger <laughs> with the other researchers. <laughs> But I did love this. I love how he manages to say he isn't flattering anyone, but then does so in the very next sentence. Yes, that's a common Tudor trait, I think, isn't it? I'm not going to tell you about such yes. and such. And then, but while we're on the subject. <laughs> yes, I, I love this quote. So I put it in. This is Polydor. Quote, since I have not written so as to flatter any man's ears, and in the end, the truth being grasped, they cannot help but approve of a history written honorably and sincerely. And you particularly, among your Englishmen, most puissant king, if in your grace, gravity, and wisdom you will not disdain, as I am confident you will not, to do this open-mindedly, then I shall deem myself to have reaped the richest reward for all the years of effort I have spent in the writing. I'm not going to flatter you, but you're you're the best. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> oh, if you think that's flattery, wait till we get to Bernard Andre. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I <laughs> can't wait. Oh, is he going to be like sickeningly sweet? You're cringing. Oh, blimey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to put in some quotes then. Mm. Polydor, on something that I did approve of, was rather critical of the history written by Geoffrey of, or Geoffrey of Monmouth. Yes. He was a great one for, <laughs> for, for making leg legend fact, wasn't he? Yes. <laughs> if anyone out there is listening to the Rex Factor podcast in the early years, you will know why. Jeffrey's history is heavily peppered with out-and-out -out fantasy. <laughs> it didn't exist, didn't happen. I can't remember. I believe at one point he talks about dragons. <laughs> There were dragons in those days, sure. There were, yes, of course there were, and oh. unicorns. They still oh. believed in unicorns. You just, they, you couldn't find them. <laughs> Polydor's views that Arthur was nothing but fantasy, and he was adamant that it was yeah. nothing but fantasy. Yeah, he'd still be lynched around here, I think, if you go to Glastonbury <laughs> and say that, say that Arthur doesn't exist. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, it resulted in him having to defend his opinion from attack. <laughs> he was he was quite nastily treated for a while. But while he is critical of Jeffrey's history, he himself was making errors that some dismiss as being expected due to the fact that he was a foreigner. Hmm. But when I read it, I felt it was more due to his need to curry favor with the current monarch in order to keep his positions. Hmm. It's the same as doing you know, research for medicines or research for something that the actual person who's created it is paying you to do the research. It, there's yeah. no way you can be unbiased. To do hmm, now, Polydor. It. How do I say this? You can tell that Polydor was doing that because he placed every king that was opposed to the Tudors or to the Tudors' line to the throne in as poor a light as possible. Mm. And. Very unfactual. The Richard III Foundation website is, of course, very critical of Polydor Virgil because he he really vilifies Richard III and has a web page that highlights all of his errors that he made in regards to Richard III. And they stress actual academic research now that proves that Polydor was completely wrong. And if Would Polydor have known this at the time? This is, this is pure bias I, or is it some stuff you wouldn't be expected to know? For all of his research and everybody being astounded that he was talking to locals to get their point of view of mm -hmm. what happened, yeah, I think he would have known. If anybody would have known that it would have been wrong, he would have been the one to have that information. Mm. And I think he just neglected it. But were there any historians at the time saying, well, that Richard, he had a point? Or anything? I mean, they were, weren't they paid? They were paid to vilify Richard. And, I think so. I think yeah. it was just smart because at that point you've got Emson and Dudley snapping up people and throwing them in prison. I'm amazed Polydor got away with some of the stuff he did. 
Is that because he was foreign, or did did that oh, not no. protect you? That didn't protect you. Mm. He he had English livings. They could have yeah. taken his money. So I I don't know how he got away without spending a lot more time in prison. Was he protected don't. by Henry? Again, I have no idea. Mm. We just we don't have enough, and I really mm. wish we had those biographies that are hinted at. That's one of my biggest irks when we're doing mm-hmm. the research is when everybody's like, well, if you read this biography, I'd love to. Where is yes. it? Give it to me. But no, it doesn't exist. If you're interested in reading a translation of the section of the Historia Anglia in regards to Richard, the History of English pod site, pod, blah, the History of English podcast website has a page with translations and they're really good. If, if we can... We'll post it on our website in the episode notes. I think we can. There's, there's no nothing wrong with us posting their website link, right? We're not. No, I wouldn't have thought so. No, um, we should Maybe. do anyway. It's a brilliant podcast. Oh, I love that podcast. David has one of those voices and manner of talking that I call cozy. He's just somebody <laughs> that you can put on and listen to all day. I love that podcast. The final edition of the Historia Anglia was also not terribly favorable to the Tudors. So like I explained earlier, when you get farther and farther away from Henry VII, the nastier and nastier the editions become. Is is that because he's had so many... Bad um, experiences? But yeah, yeah, yeah. he's had so many hits with, with, with authority and come out quite badly. That's what it feels like. So a lot of the quotes that we've got are on only or in later editions and later times in his life. Mm. Unless he's talking about somebody else, then it's whoever he's in favor of seems to be the one that he's trying to keep happy. When I read portions of these books, you could almost read the mood change. You could see where one edition kept the original but then this is from a different edition. Is that also, do you think, the change in Henry's reign? So he might have been quite pro everything that Henry was doing to start with and then thought, hang on, this is just going weird. No. Uh, or, or did he not arrive in the country until... Did it well, 1502 weird? is right when Empson and Dudley started. Yeah, so... So he never got the original reign. His tone mm. seems to change once Henry VIII is in charge. And... Mm. Even and everybody was, everyone thought he was wonderful to start with, didn't they, Henry VIII? Yes. Better well, than dad. Polydor... In Henry VIII's reign, Polydor had signed the renunciation of the papal supremacy under Henry VIII, even though he was technically a papal agent. Mm. Mm. <laughs> in 1536, so quite a bit of time down the road, um, he felt very keenly that Catherine of Aragon had been badly mistreated and that the Catholic Church had been betrayed, but he kept it to himself until he was out of England with no reason to return. Very wise, I would think. Yes. He made his views known quite blatantly through a final edited version of the Anglica Historia. And through it, I think he got kind of a revenge on the Tudor monarchs. This may be why we get a feel of side quotations. So in the first publications and in his letters about other people, we see that he's hiding, highlighting everyone else's failings, almost as if he's trying to make the tutors look better. Mm. But once he's out of England and not going back, you can see all these nasty comments about the tutors, how they were reigning pop into his publications so yeah you can almost see like i'm gonna get back at you and this is gonna be there for the entirety of history so it's a bit of a range yeah so um it's just as well we've done him because we just thought he was a snide man but obviously he has reason to be so he can now he now now he can speak his mind because he's not in the country so yes 
So yeah. the first snide comments are against other people, which is a lot of the comments that we've got. And if you read the whole text before you get to that quote, it's also saying Henry's amazing or his agents are great and this person is not a good person. Very much, I'm backing this horse. Mm. And then his final version is exactly the opposite. These people are evil, they're this, they're that, they're this. And it, it just kept on going. Mm. It has a very different, very different tone. But it made me think of all the times that somebody's been angry. And I'm sure everyone can remember writing a text or an email that was sent when they were angry and wished they could take back. <laughs> <laughs> or drunk <laughs> or drunk <laughs> i'm pretty sure this is polydor's version it just happens to be a great big publication yeah also it's not as if you press send and then thought oh god what have i done no you know this takes a while doesn't it? yes it's it does be printed and published and... and to go through and specifically change certain areas to make it be more nasty to one person like that would take a lot of time and research wouldn't you calm down during that time hmm I don't know. Maybe he's not the type that does calm down. Yeah. Mm. So what did he say? What did we got specific examples of what he said about Henry the Seventh and Eighth? I didn't want to go into specific examples just because if I did that, I'd have to give you six versions of the translation. Mm. You, are, everybody's welcome to go read his mm. historic books. If you go to Oxford or if you study history. They are still taught in England, and you can. All oh, start... right. So when you say if you go to Oxford, you don't mean if I jump on the train and go to Oxford. You mean if I got to, got <laughs> go to, to get Oxford there, or Yang, get there. Cambridge <laughs> University? You can right. you can study them there. There's actually classes okay. on them. Well, I've probably left that a bit late now. I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. You can still do it. He was um, a pro prolific writer. The earliest known, still known, and I'm going to say still known because there are hints that he wrote a lot more that just has disappeared. They weren't republished. We don't have any copies. His earliest known is a commentary on Marcus Valerius Marialis, a.k.a. Marshall's epigrams. Oh, yeah. These are st satirical statements on a wide variety of subjects, and Polydor wrote that in 1496. I know one of them. Really? What is it? Yes. It's, hang on, let me get this right. So I can't remember the name of the person that he's getting at, but it says um, Julius or whatever his name was. His hair is black, but his eyebrows are grey. And I don't think he dyes his eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That's come down to us from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yes, you can still buy Marshall's epigrams. They still exist mm. in book yeah, published form. It's amazing yeah, how many things Penguin. keep going. <laughs> the Proverbium Libellus was written in 1498 and Erasmus's version was published in 1500. So there is an actual physical difference in the copies. Polydor uh, yeah. Virgil's was written first. This uh -huh. is a Latin proverb collection. At first, I thought this would be a small publication. I'm thinking like a little tiny booklet until I found references to the fact that there's over 300 proverbs in the original publication. And the second publication added another 431 proverbs from the Bible. So mm. it had to be a significant book, mm. not something minor. And that was what brought him to the attention of Henry VII. So I wonder what you're meant to do with them, whether they're like these things you get with um, an inspirational thought for every day or something like that. Maybe you have, those... Is that how you're meant to use the book? Uh, those were intended to create a record of proverbs from throughout Italy, almost as a gathering a cultural record. Yeah. That seems to have been his intent. Like you get people collecting folk stories. Yeah, so, hmm. exactly. The Anglicae Historia Libri, 26, <laughs> so yet another name for that. Um, is the English history in 26 books, 27 books in other publications. I'm not sure how they decided which one would be split up. This is his most famous work currently, and that is due to an order of the Privy Council in 1582 under King James I of England, 6th of Scotland, who made it required reading in all schools. Oh. That's why it's still in publication, why there are so many versions of it. Presumably because it's the only... 
book of its type that started back in the 8th century and carried on and to the modern day as far as they were concerned. What at the time was yeah. thought to be proper history, you mm. know, unbiased. <laughs> you can't know. Yeah, well, I'm sure it's, a, yeah, if, if, you, if you've... If you've got Geoffrey of Monmouth and you've got Polydor Virgil, you've got proper history of Polydor, yeah. I should think. Yes, it is yeah. better. It's definitely a step <sighs> up. Then we have the Commentariolum in Dominicam Precem. 1525 was when that was written. And it's a commentary on the Lord's Prayer. Yet another book that got him in trouble with the church. He doesn't learn. No, so this one was interesting. There are apparently multiple copies. The one copy that I read didn't seem to be something that would get him in trouble. But I'm assuming the first one did. So is this another one that they would they said, right, tone it down and then you can read it? Probably. Mm. Probably. We don't have a record on that, but if you read some earlier journal articles and publications what they are saying is not what i read in that commentary so i'm thinking there were multiple versions Hmm. then we have the dialogues de prodigious this is another publication that may have gotten him into trouble with the church (laughs) since it's a sort of record of his discussions with others on supernatural versus natural events and portents like omens, which is endemic in the Catholic faith, and Polydor felt that they were all fraudulent. So saints. What happened with saints didn't actually happen. Ooh. Yeah, which made me sit there thinking, okay, you're angry with Henry VIII for betraying the Catholic Church, but you're kind of going up against everything that they hold really dear to their hearts. Mm. I'm beginning to like him a lot more, though. He seems to be quite <laughs> logical and rational for his he, age. He Definitely. is very, very logical and rational. I think that's what keeps getting him into trouble. He's like, no, mm. no, no, that can't happen. Because he doesn't live in a rational age. He's, he's living no, in the he wrong doesn't. time, isn't he? No, he doesn't. Mm. He also did another one, which was Dialogues on Truth, false, truth Falsehood, Patience, Prodigies. No, not Prodigies. Like, the perfect life. So, people who are brilliant. That's not mm. the right... What is that word? Yeah, I guess prodigies yeah, would prod- be a good yeah. word. Yeah. Um, there are also some hints that there were multiple other dialogues that he printed that have been lost. We also have the Opus Novum Gildus Britannius Monicus Qui Sapientis Cognimentu Est Inditum. <laughs> in 1525 and all of that means it's a critical look at the english historical text of gildas which he basically ripped apart but at the same time used it as proof that arthur didn't exist so that one got him in trouble in england <laughs> yeah but you've got to admire him he doesn't hold back does he no he doesn't he doesn't and... think I, this is going to cost me this is I'm, I'm not i better not do it he's out there i mean he's i know it, he's a brave I... man or extremely foolhardy. A bit of both. Yeah. Or he's angry and drunk all the time. But it did make me start changing my opinion of him. As I kept going, I was like, you know what? Good for you. Mm. <laughs> and yeah. We kept saying, well, why didn't anybody stop this? Or why didn't anybody speak out? Now we've got somebody who's actually doing it and in writing. Mm. Uh, then 1533 was his next one, which was the translation of the Greek Dios der Perfecto Monaco, which was just a translation from Greek to Latin so everybody could read it. So mm-hmm. he was fluent in Greek, English, and Latin, which is quite impressive since mm. I can, can only speak one language. <laughs> I can read, but I can't speak them. Um, the Dialo- Dialogorum Libri in 1545 is a collection of dialogues in Latin. I believe these are just published conversations that he had with others. I didn't get a chance to find a copy of that that I could read. But it sent me down yet another rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. Did he ask for permission before he quoted all these people? And did they get paid for these publications too? (laughs) Does it work like that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because history does use, if you find out in Bernard Andre's thing, he uses quotes quite happily from people that could never have said these things that he's saying. And yeah, at the time I thought, when I was reading it, I thought, you know, when you just say, oh, this is what so-and-so would have said had they had the time. What happens if the people say, I never said that. I I wouldn't have said that. 
Well, I know England was incredibly litigious in the mm. Tudor era, and you could be sued for slander. In fact, it happened a lot. Mm. I don't know. If, I don't know. Well, was he? I mean, presumably. I didn't find any record of him being taken to court other than him being in the tower. But then I don't have records to all the court records. Mm. And by that, I mean, like, judicial court. Yeah, we just have to wade through quite a lot. About that. Yes. Yeah, I I was reading some of these journal articles and I'm like, oh, I really need to find that. And then I'm th sitting there thinking, if I actually managed to locate all of this, I would spend the 11 years it took this person to write this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I only have four weeks. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you've got to say that isn't relevant. It might yes. be interesting, but it's not relevant. Yes. So, and it's hard to do sometimes. This, honestly, this is sort of a snippet rather than an actual mm. exhausted um, research. It's just not possible in the time frame we've got. But we still get a lot. In 1550, ailing, now in a country where Catholicism was almost a crime, we are in the reign of Edward VI. Right. So he's back in England. He's still in England, yes, during this time. Polydor finally decides to return to Urbino. Urbino. All right. And two years later, he passed away there in his hometown after the final publication of his nasty Anglica Historia against <laughs> the Tudors. So he, did, he waited until he was home and safe before he actually published that last nasty and one. And possibly he might have known he was ill, maybe, as well. Yes. I, thought, well, I feel I like he learned his now. lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to wait. <laughs> yes. And that's all we've got on Polydor Virgil. Well, he's an interesting, interesting man. I've, I, I will read the... Expert excerpts we get about him in a different light now. Yes, I, yeah. I actually changed my opinion about him as I was reading this. I was sort of like, ah, that makes yes. sense. It didn't come across from what I read, especially reading his own writing. It didn't come across as somebody who was nasty all the time. It came across as somebody who was very logical, but was also required to please certain people. Which must have been hard. I mean, he's being torn apart all the time. Yes. Yes, we want you to say this, but I want to say this. So. Yes. And then mm. his next version would say more of what he felt he should say. Mm. And then his next version started getting nastier towards the Tudors, which made me think, okay, now he's an angry old man. <laughs> mm -hmm. You can really see like a full alteration and cycle of academic life in Polydor Virgil. I really, really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm very pleasantly surprised. <laughs> so it's a bit like Gal Galileo saying, "No, all right, the heliocentric universe yes. is, is is rubbish, but the Earth still goes around the sun." <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so shall we rate him? Yeah. Okay. Not sure how he'll actually. No, come to think of it. Yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Amphiboly. This is our entry ground. How devious were they? The only amphiboly that I could find was mm -hmm. him speaking out against Wolsey in his letters while he was in Italy, which I'm not sure if that could even be called intriguing or if it was just him speaking the truth. Well, he, I mean, by the sound of it, he's sort of intriguing quite a lot. Every time he gets into trouble, is it intrigue? Or it's saying, just... saying something... Yeah, it's not really intrigue, is it? No. I was thinking about, and after, after he moves, so to, talking against the, well, biting the hand that had been feeding it all this, <laughs> feeding him yes. all this time. So I feel there's a sort of modicum of intrigue, even though it's not intrigue in the strictest sense of the word. Hmm. Hmm. But it's not the, it's not the sort of intrigue, dark, dark corridor type intrigue. Not at all. Hmm. In fact, he's trying to lighten all the corridors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a strange analogy, but there we go. But yeah, I, I don't give him three, I think, because three? he's he's he, he, he's not following the party line all the time. And that's yeah. not specifically intrigue, but it's sort of. Sort of. 
I'm only going to give him a one. <clears throat> he, in my mind, intrigue is definitely fine going against somebody trying to take somebody else down. And he, he never does. He well, I guess he sort of did with Wolsey if we knew if we knew all the. Oh yeah. The uh, information. Okay, I'll give him a two. <laughs> That's as high as I'm going. <laughs> Antiperistasis. Antiperistasis. This is rise and fall. Did they climb or plummet? Polydor barely changed his status. He came mm. from an influential family, remained influential throughout his life, except for the brief time he was in the tower. He did lose his position as collector of Peter's Pence, but he retained his livings when he was back in favor, which tells me they were not really parceled out to others. Because maybe then he wouldn't have gotten the same positions mm. back. But he didn't I mean, really... it's, mirac it's miraculous, really, that he did stay the same. Because yes. he was walking on eggshells for quite a lot of his life, wasn't he? Yes, so... he was. But he also stomped on those eggshells quite hard sometimes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm going to give him one for having retained his relative level in life, even when he seemed almost to have a suicidal desire to throw himself <laughs> out of it. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that, especially the suicidal. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot myself on the back. Martyrdom. Martyrdom. How far were they willing to go? This, again, the only thing we can pull on is the letters that he wrote while he was in Italy speaking out against Wolsey's corruption. We spoke he, out so often, and it yes. could have really got him into trouble, but he still kept doing it. So I think I think he has got... There is a, there is a martyrdom, though. He didn't die, die for his what he said, but, he, you know, he could have done. But certain, once he was punished for it in the Tower, he never again mixed in religious disputes or politics. He didn't even write his nasty version of the Tudors until he left mm. and knew he would never be returning and he was safe from retribution. But plenty of people didn't speak out, I suppose. He, he Very true. did. Very true. So I think he deserves a bit. Yeah, I mean, he's not a martyr in, in uh, the way that some, you know, some religious people are that will just <laughs> carry on until, I think it was Savonarola or somebody like that or Luther or... But I give him a, I give him a three because he's a brave man to speak out at all. I think. Okay, a three. Um, I'm only going to give him a two. He's he's not he's not raking in the points, is he? No, he's not. <laughs> it's just the fact that he. Once having one experience, he backed off entirely until he got into safety, which makes me think, uh, as much as it, his convictions are there, at the same time, I'm I'm like, yay, you weren't stupid. Mm, <laughs> but, yes. But in this round, you kind of need to be stupid. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he loses points for lack of stupidity. Yes. Okay. <laughs> B-team. B-team. This is our posterity round. What did they leave behind that still resonates today? This is where I think Polydor is going to make some points. Yeah. Much of his writings are still being taught at school, and all but the entire collection of the Anglia Historia are available to purchase. And mm. even that may become available later as more things get digitized. If COVID's done one thing for us, it, it's digitized so many things, and it's been fantastic. Mm. So I think eventually his entire Anglia Historia will be online. The only downside is you you kind of need to be a scholar to know of him. Yes. I think if you read anything of the Tudor times, you will come across the name. But partly because the name sticks in your mind, doesn't it? I mean, Polydor Virgil, it's a wonderful name. It really Dif is. <laughs> many gifts, isn't it, Polydor? Yes. Um. So, yeah, even if you read quite popular or populist popular history books of the time you're going to come across him yeah so you'll know his name and plenty and a lot of people do read about the tudors it, mm -hmm. it's a huge industry yes of which it is. we are a very small part <laughs> oh we are as yet <laughs> <laughs> um but i think yeah i think he deserves 
I mean, the team, your top layers are your people like Cromwell, mm-hmm. Morsey, mm-hmm. Anne Boleyn, that sort of bit person. Anne Boleyn, way up there, obviously. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, and he's not in that. He's not in those. No. Echelons. No, I might go with a five, I think. That's what a, I was a, thinking, a safe, too. safe number. A five. Oh, I should have said. Okay, so that's a five, four, amphiboly, two for antiperistasis, five for martyrdom, a ten for batim. Mm-hmm. And now flaunt a flaunt. I will share my screen. Flaunt a bleeding flaunt. Flaunt a flaunt. This is our portraiture round. Can you move him along a little bit? Another Up or down? Down? Uh, that way. <laughs> Unless I'm, hang on, I'll move, I'll, I'll move my, I'll, I'll try to switch off the audacity. Uh-oh. <laughs> Sorry, I jiggled something. Oh, there we are, I've got him now. Uh, quite a nose. Quite a nose, that's the first thing I thought of too. <laughs> and we um, have two, this is him younger. Mm-hmm. And this is him older. Same nose. Exactly very the much nose. the same nose. It's almost as if they kept the nose and changed the rest of the face, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, his nose did get longer. <laughs> the hair's the same. Do you want to describe the image? Yeah, he's quite... It's, it's, it's a drawing, a mm-hmm. sketch. I presume, it was it made at the time? or? It's an etching, and it is contemporary. This yeah. is, this is, this is a what he looks incredible like. likeness of him. He's quite... Uh, drawn in the face yeah almost haggard um, this is after his time in the tower no, so right. maybe it doesn't he's... do you any good does it no he's wearing very simple clerical clothes mm-hmm. he's got sort of slightly drizzled hair yes um it's the same tudor cut that almost like mm. ear length straight across the back hair um he's he's got downturned lips he looks very serious. Mm-hmm. Yes, he's he's not he's he's not a one for a laugh by the look of him. No. But if that's what he looks like, that's what he looks like, so I mean we've got to accept mm-hmm. <laughs> as for flaunt of flaunt, what more could you want than a picture of him? Except that's... there's no symbolism no. in his portrait. He's holding got... a book of some sort, but it, you can't tell what it is. No. And I he's can't pointing even tell if it's a book. Hmm. I don't know what it is if it isn't. It's got a cross on it, but not a religious cross. I mean, an X. Yeah. And he's pointing at people. People often did in those days, didn't they, in their pictures. I never know what they're pointing yes. at, but they always some, seem to be pointing. Oh, look over there. <laughs> um. Yes, I mean, it's it's a good good picture. If, it's, if it looks like him, then it's an interesting face. But as you say, we haven't got any of the fruity stuff. No. So, five, I think. Wow, you're going high. I have... <laughs> well, I thought, I, was... I mean, there's plenty of them. We won't, we don't have a pic. I mean, yeah, I don't suppose we've got an action figure of Polydor, have we? No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sit, sitting there at his desk with his quill. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a couple of them, we had to rely on the action figure. <laughs> at least we got a Very picture true. here. Very true. Yeah, maybe Very four. True. Maybe four, because we haven't got... Okay. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. I was mm. thinking of four. So we combine those and divide by two. So that is a four. Four flaunt a flaunt. Uh, so his total score all together. Not a lot. No, 26. It's not really... The rounds weren't made for him, really, were they? No, but he did beat out Edward Plantagenet, <laughs> Arthur Tudor... Just those two. <laughs> <laughs> and they died very young, both of them. They did. Final question. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Are they too delicious or what? That's a difficult... Yeah, it's quite an interesting one, this, isn't it? Because he's a, he's not the character I thought he was going to be. No, me either. I'm almost tempted to say yes. And I'm not more, not sure why. Maybe because I've read Bernard Andre and I can see just how awful it could be. But <laughs> 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 yeah, he uh, he didn't. He, ah, 
I'm trying to think on what basis I would be saying yes, which makes him, which implies it's probably a no. <laughs> yes, I'm. I'm not feeling it. For yeah. Him. I wish we had a sort of also ran section that uh, we could put in. We could say, no, you were interesting, but you haven't quite got it. Take what it takes. Yeah. Hmm. Unfortunately, he probably. Well, I was going to say he might. He he suffers from a lack of um of of knowledge about him, but we do actually know quite a lot about him through his writing. I mean, we know what he's yes. he thought, but I think no, sadly. I think no too. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Polly. Very tempted. Just so smartly, so we got someone a bit different because we've got a bit samey all our. our yes, people, and there aren't <laughs> many of them. <laughs> no. No, but you think how we worried we were that we would just say yes to all of them. Yes, but we're getting more no's than anything else, I think. Many, many, many more no's. Yes, but no, nope. Polydor Virgil, I'm sorry, you are not too religious. You're tutor mediocre. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I want to know what my next one is. Please, please, please. The box. Okay. Oh, this is exciting. I love this part. <laughs> this is my favorite part. You didn't like it last time. The true. <laughs> oh, so disappointing. I, oh, I wanted him. It's oh. a good one. Oh. Edmund de la Pole, sixth Earl of Suffolk. <gasps> really? So we got all, got all the de la Poles done well, for, for, nice. the t- for the time being. <laughs> oh, be my. More. That's going to be a lot of tromping around Europe. Yeah. <laughs> yep, and it's um, quite a lot of crossover with Philip the Fair. And Maximilian. And Maximilian. That'll bring Maximilian in. Yeah. Yep. Ooh. Yep, that's a good Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Because, yeah, I keep thinking, when I come up doing Philip the Fair, I keep coming across Edmund and thinking, how much do I put in? And I do very little, because we have, you know, we've still got him to do. Yes. So. Ooh. Okay, that's the end of our episode on Polydor Virgil. We hope you've enjoyed it and will join us for the next episode on Philip the Fair. Philip the Fair. Thank you for listening. You can find details of the podcast and contact us on... But we will drink together, and you shall bear a better witness back than words. There is history in all men's lives. Goodbye. Goodbye. Is it so bad to Question all things. Is it so bad to ask if something could have happened? And that Luther made some good points. What? I'm just trying to see things from both sides now. And when you think, when you put it rationally, does it seem very likely that omens are true? I'm not saying I don't believe in saints, but oops, I'm in trouble with the church again. I've rewritten your history, what more do you want from me? I've upheld your claims and dished the dirt on Richard Arthur, a real king. I'm not some kind of hippie, I think I'll have to draw the line somewhere now. Now that I'm out of the country again, the gloves are off, I can say what I want. Those lousy Tudors, delusions of grandeur. Whoops, I'm in trouble with the king again.
signed the renunciation though I didn't want to Catherine of Aragon's been hunger to try What? You forged just one dispensation Suddenly your enemy number one You sent me to Rome to get Wolsey's red hat That bloated priest deserves just what he gets I'll say what I want and I won't be kept quiet So what? I'm in trouble with the king again Feels weird. This one was so short. <laughs> <laughs> and it's broad daylight outside. It's very strange. <laughs> daylight and sunny.